I'll carry on without the slides in the time while this is being tried to, sort, tried to be sorted out. Um, so you may have been discussing all week the reasons to abandon the war on drugs that's been fought for at least 50 years since the um, international narcotics um, conventions were first signed and going back longer than that. And the principle behind though, that war on drugs is that if we just punish hard enough, then people will stop using drugs and the harms that go along with drug use will fall away. And here's a slide, a graph from our colleagues at the European Monitoring Centre on Drugs and Drug Addiction. And if you look at this slide, it's the lines show trends in drug use, and the dashed lines are countries that, at year zero, the vertical line, increased the penalties for personal possession of cannabis. And the solid lines are countries which decreased the penalties for personal possession of cannabis. Now, if there were this imagined link between the harshness of punishment and reducing the levels of drug use, you would expect to be seeing the dashed lines go down and the solid lines go up. But what we see is not that relationship. What we see is technically known as noise, no signal, no relationship between the harshness of the punishment and the level of the drug use. So the harms we deliberately inflict on people in the name of the war on drugs are not producing the stated aim of the war on drugs, which is to reduce the levels of drug use. We spend billions of dollars, of pounds, of euros every year in chasing this dream that we can punish people out of using drugs. This is extremely harmful, not just to public bu budgets, but obviously to the people who are punished. We are deliberately inflicting pain upon them in the name of this war on drugs. And it doesn't work. So no wonder that, that people, including in Belgium, have been looking for alternative policies. And there are certainly opportunities here. So we hope that by innovating in drug policy, we might be able to reduce the amount of pain that we are producing for people. We might be able to increase the support that people get through medical treatment or psychosocial support. And we could do that at least through depenalization, diversion, decriminalization, three terms that I'll go into more detail about, and also perhaps by legalizing some of these substances. I've left that term here in grey, partly because not many European countries are talking about legalizing substances apart from cannabis, and also because my colleague Dr. Carl Hart, I'm sure, will be talking more about legalization in his talk that follows mine. So great opportunities here, but also I'd like us to think about the risks that come with that inspired by one of my favorite ever books, which is this book here, Visions of Social Control by Stan Cohen, published in 1986, in which he lays out in a previous wave of enthusiasm for alternatives to punishment, the risks that are attached by what he calls net widening, the process by which supposed alternatives to the penal response, these alternatives can actually increase the size of the net of penal control. He also introduced this term, mesh thinning. The net becomes harder to get out of. The spaces of it are tightened. And also what he called social control entrepreneurship. The temptation for governments, but also non-governmental bodies to build capital on the back of this increasing net of social control. And by these processes, we might undercut the advantages of alternatives to criminalization by increasing the number of people who are caught in the net, by increasing the amount of control that we Im impose upon them. So I want to talk about some of these alternatives in the real world, um, see in which ways they may fulfill these opportunities and also these risks. In order to do so, we've created a taxonomy of different types of alternative for the, uh, alternatives to the criminalization for possession of drugs. And there are three main groups, depenalization, where existing, the existing criminal law is not changed 
but a decision is made by the discretion of the police or prosecutors not to enforce that law. Diversion is similar, but it also adds this creating a bridge between the criminal justice system and the treatment system, as Stefan was saying, was discussed earlier this week. And that could be done either de facto, but just by changing the practices of police and prosecutors, or de jure, by installing it in law that that is what will be done with people who are caught in possession. The third sort of main family is this decriminalization, which we define as the removal of the offense of possession from the criminal law. So that's an actual legal statutory change rather than just changing the practice. But even there, there are subtypes. So sometimes it comes with diversion and with civil sanctions. Sometimes it comes with replacing the criminal offense with an administrative or civil offense. And sometimes a more pure form of decriminalization with no sanctions at all. So what I'm going to do is to show you some examples of each of these six subtypes of alternatives and how they create these opportunities for reducing the pain and increasing the support, but also are accompanied by these risks of net widening, mesh thinning, and social control entrepreneurship. So let's start with depenalization. As I've said, the law remains, the police or prosecutors take a decision not to enforce that law against people who are caught in possession of drugs. And the longest standing example we had was in Denmark between 1969 and 2004. If you were caught in possession of a small amount of drugs, you would be given a very a, a, an informal warning by the police on the street and you could go on your way. That was reversed by a conservative government in 2004, showing one of the weaknesses of these non-legal changes. Because if you don't change the law, then another government can come along and change the practice. Tom de Court was telling me about the cannabis social clubs that used to operate, for example, in Antwerp, and a change of administration sweeps it away. If you don't put the change in the law, it's very easy for a change of government just to change the practice. And even if you, and another risk here is that it's down to the police's discretion. And what can the police do with that discretion? One of the things they can do is increase the number of people who actually they interfere with. So this is what happened in 2004 in my country, in England and Wales. We introduced an informal depenalization system that was not instituted in law, but just the police were told, instead of arresting someone if they're in possession of cannabis, you can give them an, a formal, an, an informal warning on the street. At the same time, we were telling police officers that they had to increase the number of people they caught for an offence. The easiest offence to catch someone for is cannabis possession. There are lots of people doing it, it's pretty easy to identify who's doing it, and it doesn't take much to prove that somebody's done it. So that's a pretty easy offence for a policeman to tick off their list. And what happened was that yes, there was a reduction in the number of people who got formal cautions, but a massive increase in the number of people who got any contact at all with the police. So lots of these offences previously would have ended in a police officer saying, this is too much, for me, too much for me to bother with, I'll put the cannabis down the drain and let that person go on their way. But in this case, they got a, an intervention, which on a second offence would lead to a fine, and a third offence lead to a criminal justice sanction and a criminal record. So yes, the, the net became softer, but it also became bigger. The next example is police diversion. So this de facto, no change in the law, but through the police's practice, they divert people away from being arrested to an assessment and a discussion and perhaps treatment entry if they need treatment. And there are several examples around the world. Australia has several examples within it. And there's also been an example in my country in the West Midlands. We're currently evaluating three parts of England that are doing this de facto diversion. And the research that's been done so far in Australia and England shows, yes, it reduces the number of arrests and it reduces the costs that are incurred in the criminal justice system. 
And the Australian research shows that people who go through these diversion schemes have less damage to their job prospects and less damage to their family relationships. These are good outcomes. There was a randomized trial done in the West Midlands, in the beautiful city of Birmingham, um, and it showed also that there was less reoffending in the group that was diverted away from the criminal justice system. We know from centuries of criminological research that criminal justice intervention can increase the likelihood of reoffending rather than reducing it, and this is another demonstration of that fact. We also saw reductions in the cost of processing these people. It was much cheaper to process them through an informal diversion than it was to go through the formal rigmarole of arresting, charging, and taking someone to court. But in the middle here, we have quite an interesting finding that in the usual process of taking someone through the criminal justice system, there is a high level of attrition. In this case, about 30% of those people who went through the usual process, never had any sanction at all, just because that's the way the system works. But introduce a cheaper, easier system, and more, a higher proportion of those people do actually get some sort of intervention in their lives. So compared to this group of people who didn't get any intervention, this group of people is having the state interfere with them more. Is that what we want to achieve by these new innovations. Now, some people, perhaps more conservative people, would say, yes, it's good that a higher proportion of people are getting some sort of consequence. But those who are more liberal might say, well, it's, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to be interfering in these people's lives just because they're using drugs. There are also examples of this more formal, de jure, legal institution or diversion schemes, again, many from Australia. Um, and again, we have good results from those Australian studies, reductions in arrests and costs, less damage to job prospects, but with less police discretion here. And that is a really interesting thing to think about when you're designing an innovation. Do you want to give the police discretion as to who this applies to and when, or do you want to write that down in the law under what circumstances a police officer can force someone to go and get an assessment or go into treatment? In the South Australian scheme, which was written into South Australia's law, yes, they saw a reduction in arrests, reduced use of police time, better outcomes for employment and accommodation for those people who were diverted than if they had been taken through the criminal justice system. And trends in cannabis use were not increased. Every time there's one of these innovations, there's a howl of protest, and won't this increase crime because, and drugs? Because if you stop punishing people, of course, they'll use more drugs. Well, that is never shown, or very rarely shown, to be the case in these sort of evaluations. But this issue of net widening comes up again and again with these types of schemes. So in the South Australian scheme, two and a half times more people were more likely to get some sort of notice than if the, than the arrest. So this increase of people having some sort of intervention in their life was seen in this scheme as well. And because this notice had to be paid, there was a fine attached to it, a very small fine, but still people weren't paying the fine, and then it became a criminal offence that some of them ended up in prison, which they would not have been sent to prison for the original offence. So again, this sort of net widening, mesh thinning effect can be observed. The next example the next type is decriminalization with diversion. And the most famous example of this is Portugal, which decriminalized, formally de jure decriminalized, the possession of small quantities of all drugs in 2001. So drug possession became no longer a crime if it was below those threshold weights. Criminal sanctions were replaced by a range of options for these commissions for this dissuasion of addiction. So if you're caught in possession of these small amounts, you're required to attend a meeting with a social worker, a psychologist, and a lawyer, and they will talk to you about your drug use. And in most cases, that ends in what is known as a provisional suspension of proceedings. Nothing happens. No sanction, no referral. It's just a conversation. But in cases where people come repeatedly before these commissions and they are assessed as not having a drug addiction problem, then they can be fined. And if they, are, if they do have, are assessed as having a drug addiction problem, they can be asked and advised, but not forced, to go to treatment. 
This has become quite a famous example around the world, partly because of the results I'm just about to show you. And Oregon, 18 months ago, introduced a similar system. The results I'm talking about are, for example, a reduction in the proportion of the Portuguese prison population that is there for drug offences. And this is quite interesting because there weren't that many people there just for possession alone before 2001. But this decriminalisation seemed to have sent a signal to the courts that the government wants you to treat this as a health problem, not a crime problem, so you don't need to send so many people to prison for so long. And there was a reduction in the prison population overall and in the proportion of that prison population that was um, there for drugs compared to the European average, which stayed fairly stable, even grew a bit. There was also, and this is one of the most important outcomes, of not just the decriminalisation, but the massive expansion of health and social support that came along with it in 2001, a huge reduction in the number of people in Portugal who are catching HIV from injecting drug use to very low levels indeed. A huge advantage of a social health-based approach to drugs compared to the criminal justice approach. And there was also, very encouragingly, at the start of that process, a very significant fall in drug-related deaths. Now, there were challenges to the system through the financial crisis. It became harder to provide the types of social support and health support that were reducing these deaths. And unfortunately, we do see increases back towards the previous levels. But meanwhile, in Europe, those rates have been climbing. In my country, we have the highest rates of drug-related deaths we've ever had. And so Portuguese system at least seems to be holding down those drug-related deaths. But people in Portugal don't see this as, some people in Portugal don't see this as being the final answer. This is a report from the international network of people who use drugs, who tell us that people are still being stopped and searched, still being harassed by the police, still stigmatized for their drug use, still exposed to unsafe drugs in unsafe places because of the continued prohibition of the supply of these substances. So they see decriminalization as merely the first step to what they would call full decriminalization. The most common form of decriminalization, because it's the one that has normally been adopted in the, in the United States dating back to the 1970s, is this replacement of the criminal offense with a civil offense. So in many states in the, in the USA, it has long been the practice that the police can impose, if they catch you with le less than, say, an ounce of cannabis, they impose a civil fine on you instead of giving you a criminal record. The problem with that is that the fine has to be paid, and non-payment of the fine becomes a criminal offence. Italy has also used this process of decriminalising in the law, but replacing that with civil sanctions, including the removal of driving licences. There's been research from Italy showing that made very little effect to drug use. And these sanctions that have been imposed, again, show very little effect of actually doing anything. It sometimes seems to me that it's just a sop to the Conservatives to say, oh, yes, we, we'll, we'll take away the crime, we'll replace it with something else, even though there's no evidence that the, the something else is actually doing anything that's useful. But there is one advantage of decriminalization, which is especially experienced by people um, of colour in the United States, which is these huge rates, these disproportionate rates of targeting of black and Hispanic people for drug offences. You see that reducing in both states that have legalised and also states that have decriminalised the possession of cannabis. Those rates are still higher for black people than for white people, but because there's such a high, an elevated rate of criminalization of black people for drug offenses, it is they who have seen the biggest drops in this criminalization, following decriminalization, depend, compared to those states which have not reformed their drug laws and still have continuing high rates of criminalization, especially of black people. But there's still this residual criminalization. We still see being punished and imprisoned for non-payment of fines, we still see punishment for related offences. So when New York decriminalised the possession of drugs two decades ago or more, um, they kept the offence of having drugs on display. So the police could very easily, if they wanted to, catch people and criminalise them 
by telling them to empty their pockets and that drug would then be on display and that person could then be arrested. So even though possession had formally been decriminalized, there were still huge numbers, primarily of black and Hispanic people, being processed because of the drug offenses that the police caught them for. There's also a difference in the criminalization of people, of young people. This study showed that with legalization, you get this ongoing criminalization of people who are minors under 21, because legalization very rarely applies to people under 21. Whereas when you decriminalize, you get a reduction in both youths and adults, compared to both youths and adults continuing at high rates in states that have not legalized or decriminalized. So decriminalization can have arbitrary and disproportionate effects and unfair effects on some portions of the population, depending on how it's designed and enforced. So the fullest version of decriminalization one could talk about is decriminalization with no sanctions at all. The German federal, sorry, the German constitutional court took a decision in 1994 to, that it was unconstitutional to interfere in a person's possession of small amounts of drugs. They didn't define small amounts, but it meant obligatory non-prosecution for small amounts of drugs in Germany. And that was also the case in Vermont before it legalized fully. And also Mexico, similarly by a constitutional court decision, has decided that it is unconstitutional to punish people for drug possession if the amount is small enough. The problem in, with, in both cases is these thresholds, the weights can be quite arbitrary. In Germany, the details have been filled in by the lander, by the states, and in Berlin, a more liberal part of Germany, the, the threshold for cannabis is quite high, well, about an ounce, but much, much smaller in Bavaria, a more conservative part of the country. In Mexico, the thresholds are much lower, and also, I'm told by Mexican researchers, very arbitrarily enforced. So, in effect, the same old people, the poor, the ethnic minorities, are still the ones who are being criminalized because these thresholds are so low and so arbitrary. And this is why the International Network for the, of People Who Use Drugs is calling, instead of for what it would see as these half measures, these first steps, it wants full decriminalization, which they define as the removal of all sanctions for possession no arb with no arbitrary weight limits. Independent monitoring of criminal justice actions to try and remove this disproportionality, including people who use drugs in the design, the implementation, and the evaluation, and the creation of these policies, ending the stigmatization of people who use drugs, scaling up access to harm reduction and treatment services, and moving towards a fuller form of legalization which would enable the safe supply of these substances, as well as the, as the removal of punishment for people who possess them. Now, this isn't just the wish and whims of people who are organized in this national network of people who use drugs. The European Action Plan calls for alternatives and less coercive sanctions for people who use drugs. The United Nations has called for countries to decriminalize possession. The question for us is if we follow these edicts from these international bodies and the recommendations of people who use drugs themselves, how are we going to do it in a way that actually does reduce the pains of punishment, increases the benefits of treatment and indeed of the use of drugs, while avoiding those things that Stan Cohen warned us about, avoiding increasing the size of the net, avoiding increasing the control, the tightness of that control that we place upon people. And how do, we how do we avoid reinforcing this idea that drugs and their users are always either ill or criminal? How do we move to a policy which reflects the common humanity of people who use drugs, no matter whether they are legal or illegal? And I'm sure that Carl will be talking about that as well. Thank you very much for your attention. So thanks a lot for this very interesting
presentation presenting all the different models and going into depth in these models, whereas most of the time I think we go very quickly over it and, and, and keep on arguing with all the same arguments. We have some time for questions, so please I would invite you to ask Mr. Steven some questions. Um, yeah. You can do it in English, that's the most easy one, but if you do it in French, there's uh, also a headset here. Je but if you faire en français, mais pas en flamme. There's also a micro in the, in the salle. In the, in the salle. Uh, good morning. Um, just a question on Portugal. Um, do you know what their objective was behind the decriminalization? Was it harm reduction measure? Or, I mean, don't want to imply that governments have clear objectives, but just wondering. It's, it's, it's a very interesting question because these drug policies are very often talked about in very technocratic terms and judged as if their aim is somehow to reduce the levels of drug use. That was not the, level, the aim of Portugal. It was not even just their aim to reduce HIV and deaths, which were at high levels in the late 1990s. The explicit aim of the Portuguese drug policy was to include everyone in society. So this social inclusion theme, this social justice approach was very much at the front of the rhetoric around this policy. It wasn't seen as a technocratic solution to a drug problem. It, it was more about how do we include everyone in our society. Good morning. My name is Louis Letellier de Saint-Just. I'm from Montreal, Canada. I'm a lawyer in health law and I'm with the Quebec delegation for this wonderful week organized by our Belgian friends. Uh, Dr. Steven, you, you, you talked about um, police involvement and police discretion in many of the models. But how do we frame the police discretion? Because it can be extremely dangerous to leave police handle discretion so we could have a wide range of actions. So how do we frame that? It's interesting. Um, as criminologists, we know about police discretion and we talk about the police being an unusual organization because the level of discretion increases the lower you are in the organization. Police officers on the street have quite a wide range of actions they can choose to take against a person they find in possession of drugs. So you're exactly right that leaving these decisions in the discretion of the police can be dangerous, especially in those situations where we know that the police are likely to use those powers in ways that are racist and discriminatory against certain groups in society. So one solution to that is to reduce the discretion that the law allows to the police. So in my own country, we have made a proposal, I have made a proposal with colleagues that we reduce the discretion of the police by removing the offence of possession through the criminal law. So that reduces the discretion that the police have to interfere, to get their hands in people's pockets, to choose selectively who they're going to um, intervene with. Now, some people might throw their hands up in horror and say, the police need those powers. They need to be getting their hands in people's pockets to reduce crime. I don't see a lot of evidence that the high rates of stop and search that we have in our country, which are about nine times higher for black people than they are for white people, I don't see much evidence that that is effective. I think that reducing the police discretion in these issues can actually steer police towards more effective ways, more intelligence-led, more um, community partnership ways of doing work that reduces the harms that are associated with drugs and drug markets. Dr. Stevens, thanks for your presentation. I forgot where I read it. Maybe it was in a pamphlet by a Portuguese action group of uh, people who use drugs, but they were talking about this idea that if a government should decriminalize, it kind of has the possibility to get stuck in that kind of thinking, thinking that, oh, we've done something, we decriminalized, and now it's okay for the next 10, 20, 30 years. I thought that that, that was their critique on the Portuguese model. Do you have any... Um, ideas on how to counter that, yeah, that happening. It's interesting because the opponents of decriminalization often describe it as either a slippery slope or a Trojan horse. The idea that there's always some design behind decriminalization to take the next step to legalization. And I always find that quite odd. First of all, because the slippery slope is neither very steep nor very slippery. 
many, many countries have got stuck at decriminalization and not moved beyond it. And this argument that it's a Trojan horse is really odd because the Trojans actually hid in the horse. Nobody's hiding that some people want to legalize drugs. It's a really weird Trojan horse. Um, the way to avoid getting stuck at that system, which I think is a danger, we've seen that, you know, the, the, the states, many states decriminalized possession of cannabis in the 70s, took decades to move beyond that. The, in, the, in England and Wales, we, dec we decriminalized abortion in the 1960s. It's still a criminal offense. We haven't legalized it. And so the way to, you have to continue that momentum. I mean, I was talking to Carl last night. This is a, this is a question of getting the people to say that's not sufficient. We want to move further. And certainly that call is coming from people who use drugs in Portugal who want to move further. Do you think if you want to have influence on the policy, does it have to go gradually, like decriminalize, depenalize, and then you have the legalization? Or would you say like we just have to go straight into legalization? I think it's more likely to happen gradually. I mean, I talk about progressive decriminalization, and it's progressive in two ways. One is that it has to accompany a program of social justice, which recognizes that people have problems with drugs, not because of the drugs, because of the situations they live in, situations of poverty, despair, abuse, and neglect. And we have to tackle those issues if we want to resolve the drug problem. So it's progressive in that way, but it's also progressive because it moves in steps from the decriminalization of cannabis to the decriminalization of the possession of all drugs, from the regulation and supply of the supply of cannabis to developing and evaluating methods for the legal regulation and supply of other substances. And I think that's much more likely to create this progressive movement towards a more sensible, rational drug policy. Now, there will be many blocks and obstacles on the way. There will be many mistakes made because the design of these systems is very complicated. There's many interdependencies that could be beneficial or harmful, and the only way to find out is by testing in various contexts. I think it's more likely to happen if we take this progressive approach than trying to do it all in one big bang. Thank you. I have a question here in the front. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, my name is Ben Sessa, psychedelic medical researcher in the UK. Um, I'm interested in what you think the general public and media think about drug policy reform, because we in this field tend to live in a bubble. Um, my impression is that most people in the general public and media think that we want drug policy reform in order to facilitate the hippies to get high without getting busted. Yeah. And of course, they want drug policy reform because they want to take drugs and they don't want to get busted. But for the vast majority of people who don't take banned drugs, um, they, that's how they see it. Why should we change things for this smaller number of people who just don't want to get busted? And the message hasn't seemed to get across that poor drug policy affects everybody, whether you take drugs, hate drugs, like drugs, detest drugs. Um, whereas, in fact, the truth is, even if you hate drugs and never take them, the policy is wrong and it is hurting you, the non-drug taker. Um, so for example, I have no interest in horse riding, none whatsoever, couldn't care less about horse riding. But I want to know, as a member of the general public, that the laws in place of horse riding are the correct ones for the horse riders, but also for me, especially if it's costing me 20 billion pounds a year to mop up the problems of poor horse riding policy. So we need to somehow sell this message not to the drug users, because obviously they want reform, but the people who hate drugs. We need a way to tell them. And what's your opinion on that? Have we done enough? We've got data and data and data, but data doesn't seem to work. How do we tell the general public? Yeah, I agree with you that data alone doesn't work. And I am one of those people who wants hippies not to be busted for <laughs> smoking their own weed. Um, but I also think that there is work to be done here. There, there is polling on this in the UK, and over the last decade, there's been an increase in support for both legalization and decriminalization of cannabis, but very low levels of support for the legalization of things like cocaine or heroin. There's a job to be done in... For me, it's a moral issue. So the people who hate drugs, they don't hate the drugs, they hate the people who take the drugs. So it's a question of humanizing the people who take the drugs and doing, as they very explicitly did in Portugal, as I said to the earlier question, this job 
of saying these are people who are worthy of respect in our society and they deserve dignity. And so one of the things you see people working on in the UK is destigmatization campaigns, making sure we don't use stigmatizing language, um, maybe avoiding talking about the harms of drugs and talking about drugs in a po positive way, and just avoiding this jumping to the communication that drugs, we're going to save, dr save money because dr people who take drugs are so criminal that the only way we can do things is by treating them. If we keep on doing that argument, which has been quite effective in levering money out of the government to get money to treatment by saying, oh, these people are all committing crimes and therefore we have to treat them in order to stop the crimes, that just perpetuates this idea that drug use is pathological and criminal. We need to be focusing more on creating this common humanity between people who do or don't or use whole varieties of substances. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one last question before we move on to our next speaker. Thank you. It's just a bit of clarification about the net widening and the mesh thinning uh, that you talked about, because you've shown it clearly with a few um, with a few examples from a few countries. But what I'm curious about is um, the explanation behind it. So, why does this happen? This mesh thinning and this net widening. There is an urge to control. So I'm writing a book at the moment about, about drug policy constellations, the different actors and how they operate with each other to create drug policy. And in the UK, and I think in other countries as well, there's a constellation of people whose mindset, whose morality, and whose personal status depends on the idea that there are some people in society who deserve control. Normally the working class, the black, the excluded, the indigenous, they deserve control. And so if a system of control is taken away, another system of control will be invented so that that mindset will still have its say and also the opportunities it provides to impose power. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Mr. Stevens, for your very rich, rich presentation, for all the material that you have collected through the year and uh, through the years you're presenting now. Thanks a lot. Thank I give the word to Steve.